Welcome, beautiful people, and thank you for joining us on Till the Wheels Fall Off, a podcast by Two Folk Couple. I'm Matt. And I'm Paige. And we're here to inspire others, to bring you guys into our lives and tell you a little bit about our journey. Over 20 years together, we've learned a few things. We're going to work toward being the best version of yourself possible. We're going to dig into building a positive mindset, discuss mental health, addiction recovery, improving fitness, building businesses, and insight into what it takes to navigate life today. Welcome back. Welcome back to another episode of Till the Wheels Fall Off. I'm Matt. I'm Paige. We've got an awesome episode. I'm really looking forward to this episode. I know I cut you off. <laughs> no, it's totally cool. I'm, I'm excited. Too, I'm excited. <laughs> the cocoon stage of healing, like a butterfly, right? Caterpillar turns into a butterfly, but a first it goes into a cocoon, and it's a wonderful metaphor that sort of describes this process of isolation and education and really getting down to the root of the changes that you're going through. And we're going to talk about that today, and it's where a lot of people are are at right now yeah I've recognized this in a lot of um, wheelies and I'm I'm just excited to share my experience in this and what it did for me and same with you because you went through it as well yeah but we didn't know we were going through it while we were going through it so I think this is gonna be really beneficial for those that are going through it now for sure because it's got a label on it for sure and it makes sense first things first we got a few announcements okay first one is gonna be a newsletter that we always forget to mention we have a free newsletter. If you go to our website and go to, it's tufo.com, T-W-F-O.com and scroll all the way to the bottom, you can sign up for the newsletter. Put your email address in there. We're not gonna sell it. We're not gonna spam you or anything like that. You get a, a weekly newsletter. It's totally free. Yeah, and if you have signed up and you're not getting them, shoot us an email. Uh, email at info at twofocouple.com because there were some issues with some people who they it wasn't going through. And yeah, it was the like going system to the that junk. distributes it is confusing to say the least. Well, let's. Just, I can't put their email addresses in there. They have to do it themselves. So if you're not, there's if you, a legal thing that so goes maybe, along with it. So maybe it. that's it. If that you're not getting it, then you have to just sign up again. Yes. See what and happens. And then make sure you check your junk mail because they send some type of like like uh, confirmation. You confirm email. you've signed yeah, up yeah. for this. Yeah. Ah, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Otherwise, you could I, just sign up anyone up for. Yes. Exactly. Emails. That makes sense. Right. Right. There's a process for it, and it, it does make sense. But it's really frustrating when some people ask you, like, "Hey." I, I, I need help here. And I'm like, I'm trying. I don't know what to do. Like, I've, I'm putting your name in here, but it's not working. It has to come from your your side. So, yeah. So, yeah. It comes out once a week. Matt writes it. It's his thing. Yeah. it's Beautiful writing. I love it. I don't know about that, but I do my best. And I think that most of the time, there's usually a good story in there. Yeah. Should be helpful been, for it's you. It's been really helpful. The next thing we've got is the community. We have a free Facebook community called Tufo Community. If you're not aware, um, I hope you are by now if you're regular listener that we have a free community that we would love to have you in. We just hit 3000 members. Did we really? Mm -hmm. Awesome. I we noticed were, it today. We were really close for a while. <laughs> yeah. it, it goes through periods of growth and stagnation sort of as the algorithm of TikTok flows. Yes. Because that's how most people discover us. Right. So you'll get like a bunch of members and then it just dies for a while. It teaches you a lot so. about life and how life works. We'll talk about some of that today too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but if you don't know where to find that, go to our website or click the link in any of our social media profiles and there would be like a shortcut to it there. Yep. Next thing, I'm holding a rock here. What's this rock about, Paige? That is for the partners and spouses who have gone through recovery with somebody. It's yeah. It's it, like a chip. We get a lot of couples that listen, more than I ever thought actually. So shout out to all of you that are listening. We're almost out of rocks. It's crazy. Yeah. I thought that these would be around for 10 years. I know, but we didn't know. This is interesting. Yeah, it's a, a, a really cool listener up north gave us this idea. Um, it's a token of appreciation, really, for spouses and partners that have worked through this with somebody and and gone through all the shit that recovery requires. Yeah. And it's a it's a way to acknowledge their journey. Like I got a chip, three, six, nine months, and then annual anniversaries. And I remember the first time I came home with one, I showed it to you, and you're like, "Cool." Like you were happy. Don't get I me wrong. I was proud but, of you, but it was really but, hard to like really tell you how I felt about it. Yeah. There was some part of you that felt like you, you hadn't been acknowledged. Yeah. And you're right. You hadn't, right. you hadn't. So we're trying to, to cut through that. So on the back of it, it says, thank you for being my rock. And on the front side, it's got our logo Tufo. Uh, really cool. Really cool. So hop on the website. We've got stickers as well. Waiting on hats and shirts should be here soon. I think. I hope so. 
I need to check. I, I, need, I, was, I need to touch base with him. <laughs> I was going to ask me. you about him yesterday and see if you've gotten an update on that. No, not yet. Oh, not I yet. haven't gotten a new water bottle yet, though. But thank you to everyone who has sent some uh, awesome water bottle suggestions. links and suggestions. And I have to go through them all to figure out which one I want. I might have to go and pick out like three of them to see which one's going to work for you me. You hate shopping. This would be fun for you. I don't. I needed just like two options, y'all. Just two. But I got like... I don't know, 10 at least. And then more like in a link of like different ones. I'm like, Oh, this is overwhelming, but I'll figure it out. <laughs> I'll go through them and be like, okay, maybe I'll just do an eeny, meeny, miny, mo and see what happens. Last thing before we get started on the episode, I wasn't sure if you were done there. Last thing before we get started on the episode is the course. We still have a course available. It's still out there. It's changing lives every single day. Yes. We hear from more and more people that are working through it. And it's, it's incredible to watch the growth in people that it, that take the course. It's a really good time if you're in the cocoon stage to start working this program too. I would say the same. Yeah. You can find out more by going to independentlystrong.com. That's independentlystrong.com. Or you, I think you can find a redirect to it through our website. Yeah, you can. But it's it's 10 modules. It's self-paced, self-guided. With Paige as the, the primary narrator and author. I'm in there as well. And Dr. Taylor. Dr. Christopher Taylor is our clinical architect. So it's not just two people who, with no experience, with no certifications or degrees that made this, um, this comes with, you know, a clinician's backing. Yeah. This has been approved. This has been worked through by him as well. Um, and, and he's renowned. He's fantastic. He's phenomenal in what he does. And he makes appearances in each and every module to, to sort of give the clinical, clinical perspective, perspective on it. It's really, really cool. Also comes with free community calls. Yes. Well, it comes with community calls. Well, yeah, it's not in addition it's, to the cost of the course. You buy the course and you get And you get that. Yeah. So um, I host those every Wednesday right now, every Wednesday evening. Um, and they've been, they've been great. They've been, it, it's been a great addition to the course, I believe. I think so too. And speaking of community calls, we, we are looking for a solution for our typical community calls. Like we generally did them about got once one. a month. Just be in the lookout in the community. Okay. So there's we'll a solution We'll talk about there. it next week. So you don't have to buy it's, the it's course. This week we have something going on. Yes. Yeah. You don't have, it's not, it'll be separate from independently strong. It's more on the two foe side of things. And, um, yeah, we just be in the lookout in our, in our group. Yeah. I've been working through that. You don't have to buy the course to like, we've always been all about free resources for people. We want to offer as many resources as possible, but we also want to do this full time. You know, we want to be able to help you guys through some really difficult things and that takes time. It does. It does. So we're working on it. Be on the lookout in the community. As Paige said, hold her to that as well. If you don't see anything, make sure to follow up with her. I'm not the one posting it. <laughs> oh, okay. You don't even know what I'm doing. I've been working with somebody awesome behind that you have nothing to do with. So don't worry about what I'm doing. Right on. <laughs> okay. Are we ready to get into this? Let's do it. Let's do it. Did you know that this episode is releasing on my birthday? Yeah, I did. Actually, and the newsletter mentions that as well. Oh, does it? Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't like talking about my birthday though, even though I brought it up. <laughs> Paige used to be totally cool about her birthdays until she hit a certain age. And now we don't discuss birthdays. 35. <laughs> 30, she's 35 forever. Yes. Yes. Let's go with that. Yeah. After that, it was like, we're not discussing this. I don't want to talk about this. Yes. I mean, I'm grateful that I'm at this age. It's just, I forget how old I am sometimes. You're not even that old. Okay. You feel old? I do. I feel my old. My body feels old and my mind feels a little old because I forget things. And like waking up in the mornings, my body feels all like old <laughs> you've also been through quite a bit of shit for someone your age <laughs> <laughs> mentally could, yeah that could play into it <laughs> yeah 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 okay well our kids think that i'm younger sometimes or do they think i'm older i don't remember okay there you go just showing your exactly. age exactly there we go all right so let's let's talk about the cocoon stage so this is something that i've been wanting to discuss for weeks now um i actually heard about it from the holistic psychologist on ig we've mentioned her account before because i get a lot of information from her um that's that's pretty on point and she's awesome yeah she's really awesome if you don't follow her go follow her i even think she did a podcast over this a couple of years ago i didn't listen to it i'm very more into going into my experience and then doing some research and stuff but um this is when she put this post up i was like whoa this is a thing. This actually happened to me and it's a thing. 
So talking openly about the cocoon stage is like what's really important. It's a sign you're on a healing path and that you've woken up from autopilot and are giving yourself time to decompress process and reflect on life. It's a true act of self-care that not everyone understands. That's what she put on her post along with the um, normalizing of it. Mm, Okay. Yeah. When you first told me about this, I'm like, oh, that makes total sense. It makes complete sense. Like you think about the transition of a larva to a like, you know, caterpillar to a butterfly. Like we all know that it goes into this awesome cocoon for a while. Remember doing that in school? Remember the, uh, the, the butterfly project? I did it with the kids during homeschool. That's right. You did it in homeschool with the kids too. It's really, really cool though. It was amazing. It's one of nature's like, coolest bits yes it really is i loved watching them and seeing them even in their cocoon stage i'm like when are they going to come out when are they going to come out this is really cool but it's a necessary part of growth in general yes but especially when you're undergoing major crisis yeah yeah i think it happens throughout our entire life so i before we get into like what it is i do want to talk about what the holistic psychologist put on her post i'm going to read it so that people know what we're talking about And then we'll get into it. Let's run it. Is that all right? All right. Normalize the cocoon stage where your friends don't see you as much, where you recover from the overstimulation of life. Here's why. Human beings have natural seasons of life. At times, we want to be more extroverted and connected to community. And at times, we are called inwards to spend time alone, to reconnect with ourselves. The cocoon stage comes when we are searching for more, when we don't want small talk, when we feel the pull of our of the body to rest. It's a sacred experience. Because it's not normalized, family and friends can take our cocoon stage personally. They can view it as rejection or self-isolation. The The cocoon stage isn't isolation, it's our solitude. In solitude, we heal our body, expand our mind, and we have to give and we have a space to grieve, process, and reflect on our life. We're conditioned to keep going, to keep pushing and grinding in a constant stream of distraction. Allowing ourselves to go into the cocoon stage is a radical act of self-love. Reject the idea that you always need to be connected to everyone. Or that relationships require your physical presence 24-7. In healthy relationships, periods of space are respected and understood. Giving someone the space to heal, grieve, and grow is a love language. After the cocoon stage, we return as better versions of ourselves. We're more patient, self-aware, and more present in all our relationships. Growth sometimes means connection and community, and sometimes it means solitude and recovery. Beautifully written. I love that. I do too. Love that. So you mentioned earlier that we had both gone through this. And I think that most listeners intuitively understand exactly what you mean. It doesn't really need an explanation, cocoon phase. Yeah. Um, when you were going through it, though, you really had no idea what it was. But yeah. you know what? It, you you, you kind of did in some ways. Yeah, I knew it was necessary. I knew it was something that I had to go through. So... Just run us through your experience with this. Okay. So whenever I go, I was basically in survival mode when I had my anxiety, depression, and panic disorder, you know, years after you got sober and everything came, came out when I hit my rock bottom. If you haven't heard my story, go back and listen to my story. But this was the time when I started to go into the cocoon phase. I hit my rock bottom and I started going to therapy and I realized that I have to change. Something has to change. I can't go back to what I was before. It's not going to happen. So I ended up um, removing myself from social media for at least six months because it was just, it was too much for me to handle. I started backing away from friends and family. I started to really like focus on myself and focus on my healing and self reflect. And I knew that I had to change something. It was like an identity shift. I didn't know that's what it was when it was happening. I just knew that it had to happen no matter what. What was the, I guess, the moment that this all started? Like, do you remember when you kind of transitioned from old you into this cocoon? I don't know specifically when I did it. It was just when I was in therapy and I, it would just, it just kind of naturally happened. But it was through therapy. Yes. It was through therapy when I was realizing that something had to change. And I don't want to speak for you here, but it's it's when you learned about narcissistic abuse and a lot of the things that you'd experienced. Yes. It's when I was being validated. 
and it's also it's like this aha moment where you realize what it is that's been affecting you all this time and it's like you you start to digest all this new information you start to read new books you start to listen to shows like this one and it kind of leaves you lost like we talked in in our last episode about um, being naive and then being cynical and you know ultimately being empowered and and wise but it's almost like that there's sort of like this um, like divider between naive and cynical. And that's kind of what this was in some ways Yeah. where once you discovered the truth about everything, it was like, you couldn't go back to being who you were before. No. So now you had to get in the cocoon Mm -hmm. and figure all this stuff out and begin to heal and process it and kind of get, get used to this new person, like this new identity, like this new mind that was living inside of you. Yeah. And that's, it's rough. It's really rough. It's scary. It's really scary at first because you think that something's wrong with you because you feel like, oh, well, I, why, what is wrong with me? You know, something's wrong with me that I have to be in this stage that I don't want to talk to anybody. You know, you don't want to really have small talk. You don't want to be there for your friends. You don't want to, you just, you really want to be in a safe space by yourself to learn how to cope and manage things. And that's scary because you're having to reflect on things that happened in the past And then you're like, I don't want to do that again. So what do I need to do to make sure that doesn't happen going forward? That's part of the cocoon phase and what you have to deal with. So, but I embraced it instead of like being really scared of it. I think I really embraced it because I knew that I had to do it and I didn't care what stood in my way. Yeah. You talked a bit about the social pressures that kind of go along with this and getting off of social media for a while. So you were, um, you were in direct sales for a little while. Yes. And that requires a ton of upkeep in social media. Like it's constantly staying on top of the trends. What's the algorithm doing this week or this day? And it's like team meetings and it's constant posting. And I had, I was a content creator. I had to be live a lot too. Yeah. And do my face a lot, you know? And it doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to be in that space. I think that someone even just, I think society kind of tells people, this is how you should be operating. You know, Mm -hmm. and social media is really, really bad about this, about showing everyone the highlight reels. And um, there's a lot of a lot of quotes that I think you could you could look at at a certain time in your life and take a lot of good things from. But then there are other quotes when you're going through something like this, like these motivational optimism, happy, happy quotes. Mm -hmm. It's like you just want to throw your phone in the trash when you see him. Yeah. I can't apply this to anything in my life right now. No. So social media can be a really toxic place Absolutely. for someone going through this. Yeah. I, I think it was wise that you did that. Oh, I think it was too. I think it was a really big deal for me. And I actually, I, I think I let people know that I was in a really big funk right now and I'm just not going to be available to anybody. So that, social media wise. Yeah. You kind of made an announcement or something, right? I did. I did. I let them know that I was going through a funk. You know, it's, it's wild. I, the more you're on social media and if you're on it on a pretty regular basis, you kind of get to know people based on their posts. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of people have a pattern. I'm probably guilty of this to some extent as well, where you have like these manic patterns where you can get really, really, really energetic and you're posting a lot and everything's really going really well. And then you just fall off the face of the planet Mm -hmm. and you know that that's when people are going through stuff. Absolutely. Generally. And yeah. then they'll come back and then they fall off and come back. I like, think I was honest with people when I said that. I was like, if you see me off, that's why. Like I told them, I was, I, I've always been very vulnerable with what I'm going through and what I'm dealing with on social media. And I did say things like, I, if I'm not here, if I'm not responding, that's because I'm going through hell. I'm going through some shit. <laughs> Do you feel any guilt toward social media and the people that you connected with on there for not being that person? I did for a little bit, but I, again, it, I guess this is kind of two thoughts at once because I felt guilty because I wasn't doing what I thought I needed to do or what I was supposed to do because of what Based society what tell you, you to do. But I knew deep down that I didn't give a shit and I needed to do this, that I had to do this. And it didn't, it didn't matter that they weren't getting all of me right now. Like they could find somebody else to get their, whatever they needed from. Like I, I'm not that special to where they needed me. I was okay with letting it all go. I don't want to get this too far off the rails here, but you know, what's kind of wild about just, I think human psychology is we think that we're much more important than we are. It's not to say that we aren't important to some people. You are the most important thing in their entire world. Right. But in general, like on social media, like if you disappear for a few days, 
maybe they'll notice for a moment, but then the next day they're going to forget about you. Yeah, yeah, for it, sure. This goes to the same any, anytime you make a mistake out in public. Like let's say you're in a meeting and you slip up on your words or let's say that you just do something dumb. Let's say you order something that's not even on the menu. Like you just make an ass of yourself. Even if people hear you and they see it for a moment, they might think, oh, that was stupid. I talked about this in the in my your last, last episode. episode. But I did. <laughs> how, that disappears in... 30 seconds so because we just, all we think about is ourselves. Right. That's all we think about is right. ourselves. So people, like, that was something I remember when I was getting sober, I was like, well, what, what are people going to think when I'm not drinking anymore? And I remember this guy was like, no one gives a shit what's in your cup. And if like, they do, they'll get over it like, pretty quickly. No one cares, <laughs> man. You think you're that important? Really? Yes, and I was like that right there. Damn. Isn't that the truth though? It is true. It really is. Like, so and I just, it's tough because I think that, we, we deal with a lot of women, right? And women have their own unique set of issues in the world, especially when it comes to social media, being a mother, trying to stay on top of like super mom culture. There's a and lot of keep, pressure. Keeping up with it. Yes. Like Celeste Yvonne, I'm going to mention her again, talks about this in, in reference to mommy wine culture and why a lot of moms turn to something like wine. It's because of the, a lot of that stuff. It's because the of the pressure. pressure of just being a mom and the 10,000 things you have to keep up with on any given day. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. It is a lot. But I just want to reassure people that it's okay and, and no one cares. And it's not, it's not a bad thing that no one cares. It's just the nature of people. We just generally only care about ourselves. Yeah. So when I decided to get off social media and do all that stuff and I went kind of and did my own thing. You went dark. I, I, I went dark. I did. I thought that I was going to come back stronger and do the same thing that I was doing before. Okay, so you thought you were going to come back and be like a better like, a, direct a sales better person. A better direct sales person, yes. And better with social media and better with dealing with shit and all those things. That's not what happened. I became different. Just different completely. Just different. Transformed. Transformed. I was stronger in other areas, like setting boundaries. I was stronger in like learning how to not give a fuck. I was stronger, stronger in your values in as my well. values and living like, like really building myself up to be the best version of myself possible. That didn't mean that meant that I had to do something different than going back to what I was doing. I had to do something completely different. And that was a beautiful thing, but it's scary because it's the unknown. Right. Yeah. It's really scary because you think you're going to go through this phase and you're going to be like, Oh, I'm just going to come out stronger and I'm going to be able to deal with, with all the things. It's different. You're just going to come out a different person. Yeah. But I, that's not a bad thing. I don't know what the caterpillar thinks the moment that he goes in the cocoon, but let's just assume for a moment that he knows he's going to be turning into a butterfly, okay. which maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. I don't know, but they got little brains. But do you, do you <laughs> think a caterpillar's upset about becoming a butterfly? No, it's amazing. It's yeah. incredible. Right. So I don't want people to think I'm going to my cocoon phase. Like I'm just, this is my cocoon era. I'm just disappearing from the world and I hate it all. And it's just, it's sad. And it's, it's not, it's exciting. You're going to be is. transformed coming out the other side of it. You will be a different version of yourself. And I would say better version of you. Mm -hmm. Just not the same anymore. You're not going to be a caterpillar anymore. You're going to be a butterfly. You're going to be gorgeous. Yeah. you will be dodging birds that are trying to eat you and stuff, you know? Like, right, right. Like, it's, it's it's exciting. It's exciting. You, you new challenges, out, new problems, new you, new identity. It's the wisdom phase when you turn into the butterfly, right? And yeah. that's something to look forward to because you're able to handle things differently from a different perspective. But while you're in it, it don't feel so good. No, it doesn't feel good because there's a lot of changes that are being made because it's your identity. You're literally changing your identity. You're trying to figure out who you are. This is a different chapter in your life. And it's scary as hell. Like you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, like we were talking about this before the show as we were discussing the episode and like, we, like isn't life really isn't, I guess you could call it success in life. I guess that's all relative, but isn't success in life just managing crisis after crisis and using the things you learned in the previous crisis to apply to the next crisis. Right. Growth. That's what it is. It's that's what it's growth changed. really is. Right. It's, and if you think back on your life, like you've already undergone several cocoon phases. Mm -hmm. I think each time we transition in life, you undergo a cocoon phase. You undergo this period of introspection. You undergo this period of education. And it's almost like your reality has been turned in on itself. And the things you thought were once true are no longer true. And this mm -hmm. starts in early, like early childhood. childhood. Like the first time that 
you're not picked for the kickball team and you learn that your life ain't fair. And then people aren't always nice. And the life isn't just lollipops and roses and rainbows all the time. Like that's tough for a lot of kids. A lot of kids go through that. We all go through that, I would say. And then you have one in like your, your teenage years where you're kind of establishing who you are in some ways. And then what college am I going to go to? What am I going to major in? Like that's a whole nother level of it. And then you have the one where you're becoming like a parent for the first time and you're getting married. Then you have your career focus goals later in your thirties. And then sometimes things happen along the way. Sometimes addiction comes into your life mm-hmm. and you have these moments of my old ways of go, doing, going about life. Just don't, they don't apply anymore. I have to change. Something has to give, something has to change. And if the world is not going to change for me, then I have to change for the world. Exactly. And so we, we nestle up in this little warm, cozy cocoon and we get to work. And I think a lot of wheelies are doing that work right now. I a think lot so of them, just based on posts and communication we get. Yeah, this is where a lot of people are at right now. Is mm-hmm. maybe we're the maybe we're the reason you entered the cocoon. Maybe your therapist was the reason you entered the cocoon. Maybe a book that you read or an episode that you heard or a video that you watched or something is the reason that you're here. But I'm just saying, like, g- damn it, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad that you're all here. I'm glad that you're here. It's important. This is a stage that you should embrace. And it's exhausting because you're going to feel exhausted. A lot of people get to this phase because they feel exhausted and they're just like, I can't, I don't, I I can't deal with anything. I can't deal with life right now. I don't know what to do. This is an important part of your healing process. As long as you are making changes within the process, as long as you are growing and you're doing some self care and you're, you know, working listening to this stuff, reading books, learning how to cope and manage and meditating and doing all these different things that you didn't do before. And eventually you'll come out stronger from that. But it's, it's scary. It's scary. There's a bit of a warning in there. It sounded like <laughs> Why? <laughs> that while you're in this cocoon, mm-hmm. there could be a danger that you just stay in the cocoon and never come out the other side. Yes. That, that could be scary if you're not working on something. If you think that you're doing this to go back to how you were before, or if you're not working on changes, it's more of, um, I guess, a depressive state than, than, than actually change. Or just stuck. Just stuck. Yeah. Like, that's scary. Like, we've all seen that quote. Uh, I'll probably butcher it, but it's like, don't fear. The, the biggest fear you should have is being the same person you are today, tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Like, that should be your biggest fear in life. But I think that there are still so many people grappling with what could have been or what was or the potential or the dream or the idea that my life was supposed to be a certain way and it's not. And I've been there before too. You can get stuck in that phase for a very long time. Yeah. And it's like, I, I call it like the, like, it's not fair phase where just, I'm just going to sit here and just sort of just kind of sulk. I'm just going to be pretty upset, but I think it's sort of part of That's this part of it. But I think that you have to you be, have to mourn your old self. You and do, but you things. also have to be intentional about moving forward. Yeah, for moving sure. There's a, there's a gray area there. There's a gray area, but if you're in this for a long period of time and nothing's changing, then that's scary. That's more scary than actually doing the work in the cocoon phase to become the butterfly. Right. So let's talk timelines just kind of briefly. Okay. So, um, for me, it lasted a little bit longer than I expected. I think that six months to a year. What do you mean longer than you expected? What was your expectation going in? Well, you think you go to therapy three times and you're going to be fixed, <laughs> That's right? What I was for. Yes. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's like people think you go to, you go to rehab for thirty days and you're just fixed. Yeah, you you know do you listen to a podcast for a few weeks? You feel like you're going to be fixed. You read a book, you feel like you're going to be fixed. It's not how it works. Not like at all. it is drastic changes of doing a bunch of things at the same time, trying to heal from stuff. Like it's not it. it six months is the bottom like that's six months of minimum. real minimum minimum is what you need to be expected of is six months six months and then after that it's going to come apart in layers it's still not going to be perfect it'll you're, you're going to be growing the rest of your life like mine still comes off in layers i'm still trying to be that butterfly that i want to be you know, like I part, like I'm, I've partially come out, but not fully. I've had a, a, a couple of these in my adult life, like as of recent in the last 10, 12 years. Mm-hmm. And both of them were about a year long. Okay. Yeah. About a year long of just feeling like I was losing my mind Yeah, and just everything was falling apart. 
but there you look back on it it's like oh that's what was happening i yeah. was learning a ton i was re- sort of reinventing my identity i was going through a lot of shit and i was learning a bunch and if if you the, the people that are close to you it won't feel too different to them but like if a friend if i hadn't seen a friend in five years and they saw me today mm-hmm. they'd be like you're completely different than i remember you yeah i'm like that's kind of the point right i i, I should hope so yeah. Isn't that what we should aim for? Yeah. But see, we talked about this earlier is that when I went through my cocoon phase, I was afraid. I, I had, this was two thoughts at once again, is that I was afraid of how me coming out with my authentic self, how you were going to perceive me. I was afraid that you were not going to like me anymore, that you were going to say F you, that you were going to be like, I don't want to have anything to do with this. And I decided within that phase that I didn't care. I didn't care. I was like, I needed to change. Something needed to change. And this is what I'm doing to change. And if you don't like it, so be it. Same with friends and family. They're going to feel the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, they may, they may not like me anymore because I'm a different person. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that right now. It's it's okay. That's a beautiful place to be. I, I had to change. I had to do whatever it took to change. And you went through the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I went through one of these when I got sober. That was the first one. And then I went through an, another one like this huge identity shift, like this just change in the way that I saw the world and the people that were close to me. And I cocooned for a full year. We were talking about this. That t- TUFO was the result of my last cocoon phase. Yeah. That's when it started. Yeah. That was the result of it. I went to this. I mean, it, it felt like depression. That's what it felt like to me. Like you, you kind of describe more of like a process of like almost intentional like work and almost like being sort of aware of it. Like for me, it just felt like depression. I felt depressed. I felt sad. I felt like I was grieving. I felt like lost, lost, like and lost confused. and like, I'm never going to figure this out. My life's a lie. I have to go back to what was comfortable because I was at least happy then but knowing that you couldn't also. And so then you're only left with, you've learned things that you can't unlearn. Yeah. So you have to move forward. And then like, you feel like, like, what do you do? How do you go about that? And it wasn't like I had an outline for it. No one wrote me a one, two, three list or anything. You just one day, it's like, you just kind of snap out of it. And I don't know if it's, it was something I heard, but I will say this is that each time that I went through one of these things, the group of people that I surrounded myself with changed, changed. And those people, led me to coming out of it a butterfly each Mm -hmm. time it was like a group of different people like when I got first got sober it was the people that were getting sober too and I learned so much from those guys so much and women I learned so much from them about how to navigate life sober and then this other one that we went through where it's like and I'll just be transparent about it I've been working a career for the last I don't know 15 years Really, I've been around it my entire life. I was going to say, yeah. I'm I'm fourth generation in the logistics industry. And Mm -hmm. it was like something I thought that I would always do. And it's a very comfortable family style business. Um, But I had this moment that occurred a few years ago where it's like, I don't think this is what I want. In fact, I know it's not what I want. And in fact, I'm miserable doing this. And it's not just the work. It's the fact that your family businesses, when they're good, they're good. When they're bad, there's absolutely nothing worse. Nothing worse. And I would put that up against anything. And so things started to go bad there with some of the family relationships. And man, it's just, it's hell on earth. Like you hate the place you go every day. Like you cannot stand your life. Like something has to change. I'd rather just, you know, live in a cardboard box than do this. And it just, it was like, something has to change. Like, I feel like there's gotta be more purpose to my life. If this is how I make a living, that's maybe one thing, but I cannot live without a purpose of some kind. And Tufo was the purpose that came out of that. It's right. like, let's, let's help people. Yeah. Let's, let's see if we can change someone's life. Let's see if we can, there's gotta be some reason for all this crap. We can, yeah. we can make it useful. It's like, we talk about the alchemy of recovery, right? which is sort of like what butterflies do, you yeah. know, like it's little caterpillars, little, like, I don't know, I don't want to be rude and call them fat, call them chubby. This little chubby worm deal, there's you know, <laughs> worm holes, deal. holes up in this little cocoon. <laughs> he comes out this beautiful butterfly. That's like alchemy, you know, like let's take some of the worst moments of your life and let's make them beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I felt like that's, that's where we were when I came out of this and Tufo started and like, this is a direct result of the last cocoon phase. So yeah, just goes to show that like, even from the darkest moments of your life, something, something good could come of it. Yeah, and this we might have more cocoon phases. There will in be our more life. cocoon phases. There will phases. be more, and and I think the more that we learn about it, and the more we normalize it, the easier it is to get through it because you embrace it when you realize, you know what? At least I'm making changes. I think I've had partial co- like so cocoon phases can can last weeks, 
months or wait days weeks months or years like it's just it depends on the person and what they're dealing with or whatnot but i think i've had some weeks within even tufo having to go through a cocoon phase because i was shifting my identity you know things were changing within me i was doing hard things that were uncomfortable and 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 it's just part of the growth but i was able to deal with it a lot better than i was before because i knew that it was part of the process yeah you know that quote that we've we've put on here a few times it's that identity lags reality by one to two years right I think that's actually a Mark Manson quote. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure it is. Yes. But it's true. Like whenever you're going through this stuff, um, you will have changed, but you won't feel like you've changed for one to two years after the fact. Yeah. And we're coming up on two years. So we're just now starting to feel like we started a podcast and people care about it. <laughs> exactly. And that's true. It it's exactly true. how I feel it's right now feel. today. I know. I agree. Like, I still feel very hesitant to talk about certain things. And like, does anyone really care about any of this? Right, <laughs> but, right, right. This is just ha- us having a conversation in our studio, in our home. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's no, it, it just doesn't feel... it. We know we're making progress. We know that we are helping people. We, we know that, but it still feels so new to us. Yeah, and you're going to feel the exact same way as you... As you go through the education piece of this. Like, if you're working the course, as you go through that... Like, Paige and I have talked about this, like... We want to have success stories. If we don't have success stories, in my opinion, I feel like I've failed in a lot of ways. But success looks different for different people. That right there. There will be some people that want to reestablish love in a relationship after addiction. And there will be some people that are willing to work a path of recovery that make that possible. But there will be some other segment of people that show up that way. Mm -hmm. Which is why I say I hate us. Like I can't stand us being like this like happy Instagram tiktok couple that gives people hope because that's not what we ever wanted to do was just give people hope it's one possible avenue of a resolution but it's the most unlikely one as well and like i want to be transparent about that is that very few people will get what we got success for me is being authentic and living by your values like that's how i would think we should all be gauging our success and that's what i hope that we get more of than anything absolutely will some people recover just the same way that we did absolutely but i think there would be so many more people that will really discover what they stand for what they believe in what they will and will not tolerate in their lives and they will be so strong that nothing will face them not yep. not not a an abusive marriage or a, a an addicted relationship or any of those things, they will know their, their worth and their value. And if they have to walk away, they'll be more than comfortable doing that. Yeah. Well, so this cocoon phase can happen at any time within your relationship or if you're out your side of your relationship or anything, like it can happen at any moment. I do see it happening mostly when people are on the fence of um, leaving or not. And like, there's like something really big happening within their relationship. There's a big transitioning happening. So that's when I see this pop up. But for us, it happened way further down the line, yeah. or at least for me, it did. And for you too, but it was kind of different mine wasn't based on my relationship status mine was based on other external factors that were happening within our life yeah yeah i just man i i, I want to have happy endings for everyone and i think that if you stick with us you will get a happy ending maybe it doesn't look exactly the way you thought it would when you first came in here mm-hmm. but i would also argue that anyone that listens here anyone that found us and discovered us was already in some sort of a cocoon phase mm-hmm. You don't normally search things like broken relationship or alcoholic spouse or alcoholic husband or addiction in marriage unless you're going through that sort of thing. You're looking for answers like you've already come to the you're conclusion that things aren't normal anymore. And so you come here for validation and then mm-hmm. you leave with growth and empowerment. Yeah, which is incredible. We are not we're not a, a group that's going to keep you stagnant and we're all about growth and growth hurts. Healing hurts. It's not it's not it's not an easy process, but staying the same hurts more. So that's what I was going to bring up next is when someone's in the cocoon phase, Mm -hmm. like what needs to happen for them to move forward to butterfly? So what is it? What do they need to do while they're in it? Yeah. Yeah. Because I, we talked about the danger of just getting depressed and isolating. And I also don't believe that you can just force your way through it either. I think it's a no. sort of a natural process and you, when you're ready, you'll be ready, but what are some do's and don'ts? It's a natural process and I think that the first thing that you should probably tell yourself is to accept it and embrace it. Don't fight it. 
You know, don't try to change your emotions or your feelings or whatever it is that you're going through. It's necessary for you to be feeling the way you feel. Like take your time to self-reflect and actually feel your feelings. Yeah, we don't want don't anyone going fight backwards. It. Don't fight it. Don't go backwards because if you go backwards, if you can, I mean, it's going to feel like you're going backwards. Like this is one of those steps where it feels like you're going backwards because, you know, society tells you, you got to keep going, stay strong, keep doing these things. I mean, blah, hustle blah, blah, culture blah. is the worst thing ever. <laughs> you were so bad about that, babe. Come on. There's a time and a place for it. <laughs> But it doesn't apply to everything all the time. Well, I had a problem. Like, I mean, like when I went off of social media and you're like, well, why don't you just deal with it? You just need to deal with it. Or if I needed to be around certain people or you wanted to be around certain people, you're just like, just deal with it. Just cope with it. Just And I'm like, I physically can and mentally cannot deal with this right now. So I don't care what you say about this hustle or whatever it is that you're needing to do. Like, I don't care. I have to take this time to heal. Something is, is going on with me that I need to change. So I'm going to pull back the curtain a bit on a lot of recovery talk. Okay. Like a lot of times people in, in recovery will come home, like especially in AA and they'll come home and they'll start throwing all these ideas and concepts at you. Blech. And like acceptance <laughs> is a... <laughs> acceptance is the answer was a big one and it is a big one for a lot of people i still think acceptance is a great yes it's, keep going. it's literally tattooed on my ribs yeah i know acceptance is it, the answer but it means something different to me today than the day i got that tattoo thank god the day i got that tattoo i was absolutely convinced that there was nothing anyone or anything could do to me that would affect my peace and serenity mm -hmm. and that includes surrounding yourself with toxic people who were bad for you <laughs> Because I did this for a long time and yes, you can, you can, you can get to that place. And this is sort of my rub with Alan on as well is this whole acceptance is the answer thing. Like, yeah, to some degree you are responsible for your reactions to things. You are responsible for your acceptance of other people being just the way they are. But I didn't, what I didn't put together and what I didn't, I'm not the smartest is that I didn't have to show up. I didn't have to keep putting myself in those situations to run myself through this whole process where I had to find serenity and journal and call someone when it's just much easier not to deal with shitheads. Right. It was so much easier to pull back and say, I'm not giving you space anymore. Exactly. It's like apology accepted, access denied. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing this shit anymore. And so whenever you were going through it, I came home with the recovery talk, mm. right? And I'm like, no, honey, it's acceptance is the answer. You can't control how they treat you. You can't control your feelings around this. You just need to keep doing the next right thing. Like all this recovery. Oh no, shit. you would tell me I can control my feelings. Can't, sorry, can it. control yeah. your feelings. Yeah, you, you, say, you can control this. Yeah, and just, you just, just need to suck it up. Just keep doing the next right thing. And you're looking at me like, Shut just keep your side up. of the street clean. And I was like. You don't understand how that stuff means. Like the whole acceptance thing. <laughs> I remember when you first were saying it. I'm I don't just think like, that means what you think, think it means. I don't think that means what you think it means. Like I understand if you're an addict. No, it has God, a place. It especially for people place, in addiction. Big time. And it has a place here too because I tell people all the time, yeah, you got to accept the fact that your partner isn't willing to change, but that doesn't mean you tolerate it. Yeah. Acceptance and toler tolerating doesn't mean the same thing. Very different things. Very different. Accepting just means that you know for a fact that you can't change this person and there's nothing you can do about it. So you leave them in their misery and you go do your own thing. Yeah. That's what it means. It's accepting them for who they are, but not tolerating their shit. That right there. Yeah. I'm going to go off on this tangent. We're like totally got off well, of the topic, but I think there's a place for this. I think there's, I think it's a, it's a, it's a powerful message for people to hear because this is a sort of what 12 steps teach you mm -hmm. is, is this, this idea of radical acceptance. And I think it has a place in, it, it absolutely had a, a crucial place in my life. And I don't think I would be where I am today without it. Agreed. I don't think I would be where I am today without that full, just wholesale. You had to go to the other side of the idea that I am responsible for my reactions, my emotions, everything. It doesn't matter if you call me a POS at the end of the day, I have to give you permission of whether or not I believe that and give you credence to the idea. Right, like, right. But, but we're talking about our most intimate relationships. We're talking about the people that are supposed to be protecting us and keeping us safe. We're talking about interdependent marriages here. We're not just yes. talking about some stranger on the street. If a stranger on the street tells me I'm an asshole, I'm like, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, whatever. Yeah, like, yeah. That's kind of how I treat TikTok comments too. Exactly. It's like people will say all kinds of mean shit to me. I'm just like, okay, like whatever. Oh, like, whatever. It stings a little bit. Don't act like you're every, so Every so tough. often they'll cut real deep. <laughs> they'll be like, oh, this guy's still a total abusive narcissist. I'm, I'm not. That's not like, nice. That's not a nice you. thing to say. I'm trying to help you. I'm on your side. Yes. 
I'm on your team. Why would you say something? It's mean. You right, know? right. I don't, but at the end of the day, I'm like, whatever. I, I move yeah. on in 30 seconds. Where that stuff used to send me down spirals. Where I would put something in my body to change the way I felt just so I could calm down. Mm -hmm. So I needed acceptance at some point in my life because I couldn't deal with life on life's terms. Another yeah. recovery term. And I think it has a place in everyone's life. I think that even people who go to Al-Anon, they can say that had a, it has a place in my life, right? Yeah. But if that cannot, it does, it does not hold water over time. That's the problem with that idea is mm -hmm. that it will, ultimately it will make you a doormat for people. Exactly. And it will. It doesn't it will, help you empower yourself. No. And it attracts shitty people. That. You know, it's, oh, it's almost like you become a so magnet to them because, because you're all able you're to doing, just you're learning how to tolerate, tolerate abuse. It. That's yeah. all you're really doing. You're gaslighting yourself into believing that it's not them, it's me. It's not them, it's me. No, it's them. They're assholes. That's true. There are people who are just assholes. Or they just who say it's the alcohol, whatever, but it, it's not. It's, it's so not much true. more than it's that. It's not true. There's so much more to it than that. It's way more complex than that. And so, yeah, I think that early on I was th I would come home and I just I, I hope that people can hear this and they relate to some way because mm. if they've been through <laughs> been in recovery with someone, they've been through this stage where you come home and you're suddenly just like, get, I got a PhD in 12 Babe, steps. This was and five years, home. four to five years after you were sober, though. I was, just, I was in it, you know, like <laughs> in it, like indoctrinated. But I think that people who are smart keep digging and keep wanting to learn more. And you, mm -hmm. and you keep wanting to find out you know, what does this really mean? And you start to have these existential ideas and these crises about everything that you think you know. And I think that's that's what we always do, I think here anyway, is we always push for change and always push for momentum. But kind of back to the point here, bringing it back full circle, I think that you can absolutely get stuck, but there are some things that you should be doing. And so we talk about pushing for change and pushing for the mm -hmm. development of ideas. Yeah. Let's roll through those. Well, this is just how to cope with it, to go through it. Like okay. earlier we had discussed what you can do during it, which would be, you know, therapy and journaling and meditation and educating yourself, but also resting, knowing when to rest. Um, make sure that you have a comfortable space, like your safe space, have a safe space for yourself within your home um, where you can where you can go and just be alone and reflect on how you're feeling. Cry, freaking cry it out if you have to. Feel those feels. Um, Question we're gonna get there. Yeah. What if you don't have a space in your home where you can feel safe? What that's if your home is really just difficult. absolutely a mess? Um, that's a really good question because well, I know a lot of people too have young children who may have no time to get away from their children. Um, if you could hire a babysitter for an hour, go for it. If you have a neighbor, you can have their, your kids go, um, watch your kids for a little bit. You can do that. If you have family members, just something, um, even if that's not a recommendation or if that's not even something that you can do, have your kids just watch TV for an hour or so, you know, you don't have to be the perfect parent to no. your kids. And I was going to suggest even some things you can do to, to get outside the home. So something, a place of solitude that's always been this way for me is my car. Like I love my car and like, I'm, yeah, I've, I think a lot of us feel that way. I've always been a car person and it's not just because I think that the mechanics of it are neat. Like guys are, you know, typically interested in things mm -hmm. and women are typically interested in people. Yeah. Like very true with us. Well, I don't know a little bit of both, Yeah. but you're nowhere close to being interested in things. Like you don't uh, give a shit about things. No, I don't. But cars have always just been, we spend so much of our lives in them. Like why not? Like, I don't know put more thought into like that space, right? Oh so, yeah, I used to love that space when the kids were little. Yeah. Because that, they would sleep. They would sleep. In the car. Exactly, so if so you got I little kids. So I would pull kids, up and then I would just let them sleep while I would listen to something or read something or just kind of sit there mindlessly, you know? And just like, great. I'm not getting out of this damn car until they wake up, like I don't care. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of coffee shops. Yeah, coffee huge shops are great too, but sometimes shops. for me during this phase, I did not want, I couldn't even go to a grocery store, Matt. Really? Yeah, this was not even, like I didn't want to be around people. This is actually a place like where you can go and be by yourself. If you need to go for a walk in nature, you will need to do that. That's important. My safe space, like my favorite space, and I actually went through this um, in therapy, is our backyard. I love our backyard. Like that gives me so much solitude. Like I feel so good there by myself and I can be connected to the universe. Sound canceling headphones are a godsend too. Yes, they really are. Uh, I was going to say like when I go to coffee shops, yeah. I generally turn sound canceling on mm -hmm. and I'll turn on some really low music um, yeah. with no words. Like it's generally classical music or it's lo-fi. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I just people watch and think. Sometimes mm -hmm. I write. Sometimes I read. I mean, you can do that, but 
for me during that phase was not, I didn't want to be around people at all. Just didn't want to be around, just isolate in general. No, I just wanted to isolate in general because I was too overstimulated. Typically this is happening when you're overstimulated, you're exhausted and you just can't even function properly. Like it's almost survival mode, but it's a little bit, it's after survival mode because you're ready to do something different. It's kind of different. Um, and I needed somewhere in my home, something different besides going somewhere because that was just too much for me. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay, but so I mean, if you, if you're a person who is okay with being around people during this then that's fine, but like we didn't even have conversations with, you know, like I said, my friends changed being connected to family changed. Like a lot of things just changed because I didn't have the energy to give myself to anybody else. Yeah. And the, and we've, we've talked about this a lot. Like the basis of our course is social learning theory. And it's about how your environment plays into your ability to, to grow, to heal, to, to do a lot of things, to change. Mm-hmm. So it's very important. Your environment is important. So yeah. if whatever you can, if you can find some solace and make a cool space in your closet. I used to do this as a kid. I kid Hell you not. Yes. Remember my closet when I was a kid? I used to, I, I had posters in there. Yes, so I, you had I, your computer in there. I had my computer in there <laughs> and I used to get my guitars in there mm-hmm. and it, it was like my little studio. It was a chaotic home and that was the place that I could just get away. Think about kids. They do this in general. A lot of little kids, forts they'll, they'll do little like forts or, you know, MJ, our son, he's very particular on his environment and he changes it up all the time and he wants it a certain way and he'll go to a certain space for him to just sit and like do whatever. I mean, I think that it's healthy for us to do things like that too. I would totally make a little nook for myself. Yeah, so think about that. I made a Zen room. You do have a Zen room. I just don't use it. It's my laundry room now. It's become the laundry room. But it was the dining room and I made it a Zen room because I was like, this was right after I was going through the cocoon phase. I was like, I want my space. I want this area. I want it to be comforting and whatnot. I use it for a while. Yeah, we never used the dining room. I think we used it two times in the entirety of it was its existence. Oh, well, I think a lot of homes are being built without dining rooms these days. We it's had just a, different. Yeah, so if you've got a, a room that you just don't know what to do with, maybe consider making that your space in some way. Mm-hmm. Put some pretty plants in there and make it just very calming for you. Make it a journaling space. Even if it's like, as, like you said, your closet, make a little space in there if you can. That's great. I love that idea. I know a lot of people that podcast in their closets. It gets good sound great acoustics yeah way better than this yeah I don't, whatever i like it in here um the okay brick wall works really well so we're, <laughs> shut up <laughs> all right so i had talked about mindfulness and meditation um i did a lot of this during the cocoon phase a lot this is when i learned how to meditate was because i was like i need to learn how to cope or do something or just become present and it helps me regulate my breathing and helped me just connect to myself and it took me a, about three months to actually get it down Um, because I didn't know how to breathe properly. So it would almost send me into a panic (laughs) attack. It's a thing. It's actually a thing. Um, because your body, your something about your uh, nervous system. So practice doing stuff like that during this time, it's going to help you become more grounded. Um, journaling, like we've talked about multiple times, like that's the one of the greatest things that you can do because you're just putting your thoughts and feelings out there and it helps you self reflect and process your emotions. Allow yourself to feel everything, your anger, your sadness, your joy, your fear, everything that you're feeling without judgment. Like that is a big deal. And we've talked about this a lot about if you can feel your feels without judgment, like they're not wrong feelings. They're not wrong. You're not bad for feeling the way you feel. They're feeling for a reason. You're feeling it for a reason. So just don't judge them. Just let them go through you and feel them. It's a big part of the process. Um, And then maybe get into like listening to more music and some art and movement, you know, dancing. I did all of these things. Yeah, you did. I did all of these things during my cocoon phase. It was part of my um, learning how to cope phase i guess and 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 dealing with all the uncomfortable emotions that came along with healing yeah i, also, I always get much more in tune with art and music when i'm going through it mm-hmm. like on my worst days i come home and i play guitar and i might be in here for several hours and you just you you know that when i'm going like you you don't even mess with me like you, you'll tell the kids like dad's going through some shit right now and yeah. i just sit in here and play and i feel bad in some ways but i also know that i need to do it you know I have to do this. Absolutely. Right now. So there'll be things like that. And we'll get to it's the healthy. whole. Did we talk about the gel or the um, selfishness piece of this thing really yet? 
what how it can feel selfish or how others might perceive it to be selfish Both. let's get to that at the end okay because we got a lot more to cover here okay okay well i was going to just say during this process too you're going to learn how to set boundaries because you're going to learn how to um what things stress you out like certain relationships or certain people and you're going to learn to protect your energy and focus on what is going to support you in that time and this is what's scary because a lot of us don't know how to set boundaries a lot of us don't think about ourselves a lot of us don't feel like we know how to do these things but when you're in the cocoon phase you're gonna start doing this stuff you're setting boundaries without even knowing you're setting boundaries yeah like you will you will start to reduce your exposure to Toxic people, toxic things, toxic yep. situations. Yep. All these external factors that generally cause this or, mm -hmm. you know, at the very least sort of like um, bring it on will start to fade as you cocoon, as you get more introspective. Yeah. Um, practice being patient. Be gentle with yourself. Um, start visualizing your transformation. So start visualizing your growth and how you are going to transform through this phase. Imagine yourself emerging stronger and more aligned with your true self. That is what I got out of that. And it was the best feeling ever. So start visualizing that and recognize that this is an important part of the process and I'm going to come out stronger and different. Yeah. It's almost, it's an investment. It really is an investment. Um, I never like, this is funny. I studied finance and I have a degree in finance and like it was a, pa it's still a, a passion of mine, like intellectually, mm -hmm. but the idea of investing was always boring to me. Very boring <laughs> for a long time <laughs> in my life. It was boring. I like to spend money, you know, like at one time in my life, I liked to spend money cause it made me feel good, Yeah. but I didn't like investing because it didn't feel good. No. And it's, it was risky and you didn't know what was coming out on the other side. And yep. it's a, I mean, in a lot of ways it's a metaphor for my addictive behavior. It's like, I, I need, I need instant, what's now instant gratification. I need what's now I need, I need this, you know, but yeah. cocooning is a, it's a bit of an investment where mm -hmm. you're, you're putting forth all this effort, but just know on the other side of it, like what she, you're talking about here, which is like visualize this. It, you're going to be a butterfly. You're going to be gorgeous. You're going to be amazing coming out the other side of this. You have something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. It's not going to get worse. No. If you do this right, if you it's do not it, gonna it's not going to get worse. No. I promise you that. No, there will be times where you'll go like this, of course. Doesn't mean you won't have ups and life. downs. Right. But this is a transformation mm -hmm. happening. Embrace it as a transformation for the good. Next up. That was it. Oh, that was all of them? Yeah. Unless okay. you have something to add to that one. No, no. I Talk for a moment about the selfishness that you feel or that is perceived by other people. Okay. Well, I felt like, of course, I, I did feel a little selfish because I was not giving myself to people anymore as I used to. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a people pleaser in me as well. And also being there for everybody and all these things. And then I was like, okay, this feels weird. Maybe I'm doing this wrong. Maybe I'm, you know, maybe I need to just like Matt says, suck it up and deal with it and figure it out. Um, but the other side of me was like, no, I can't, I literally cannot give myself. I have to be selfish in this part, but I wasn't selfish with, you or the kids and it's not even selfish we use that word incorrectly yeah which is what we mentioned in one of our episodes recently when you know what you need it's like <clears throat> when you're really really thirsty like you don't apologize for drinking water or when you really have to go, go to, the, to bathroom, the bathroom you don't apologize you don't really apologize just... for like moving someone out of the way like, i have to go i need this right now yeah kind of feels that way like you survival. know it's like it's survival exactly it's survival mm -hmm. like i have to do this right now yeah um selfishness like I, I remember not i remember feeling selfish and being selfish but also not really caring whether or not it was selfish exactly i needed it more than anything exactly like my survival depended on it i had to be selfish i was like this when i went through this cocoon in my recovery mm -hmm. and i was like this again when i went through this transformation a few years back yeah where i, I had people approach me more than one basically telling me like you've changed and I don't like it and I don't know what you're doing now, but you're not who you used to be and you haven't communicated with me. And I'm like, tough shit. Like, I don't know what to say. That sounds but I'm unhealthy not really apologizing coming from for people. It. And it was, it, I think that the, the person, I mean, it was a, a, someone I love. I don't want to like demean them or anything else or say that their feelings were invalid, but they were right. Like I didn't really communicate it, but I got, my circle got really, really small, like mm -hmm. three people 
that I really talked to on a regular basis about all this stuff. Mm-hmm. I didn't I didn't feel like I had to tell everyone in the world no, you about don't. what was going on. And you so have I to think, justify everything. So maybe that's something we get into for a moment. Like, do you think that you should tell people or announce this? Like you sort of did it in social media in a way, but what a, what about other people? Like, do you communicate this with your addicted spouse? Do you communicate this with your mother or with people that you I, generally talk to on a regular basis? I think it depends on what you expect to come out the other side. Like if you're comfortable speaking to somebody who's going to be understanding, then yeah, go ahead and tell them and say, all right, cool. I'm here whenever you're ready. But if you feel like it's, you're going to say it to somebody who isn't really mentally stable, who might say, well, that's stupid. Or, you you know, kind of like you did to me, <laughs> to me in a way. <laughs> I mean, but as long as you're okay with just, um, not giving a shit how they react, then you can say something. But I also feel like it's not hundred percent necessary to say anything. It really depends on you and where you're at. Yeah. I think that with your close relationships, generally there's an ongoing dialogue that's going to exist and they're going to know and people that get it, get it. And they're not going to question you. Right. That's been my experience. And you kind of what you mentioned was that there's going to be another set of people that rely on you for different reasons. These are generally people that take, take, take yep. from you yep. and they're not going to like this. They're not going to like it. No, it's going to feel like you've changed. You're keeping me out of your life. You're doing all this thing. What, Man, whatever. This is what I need right now. Period. Just had an incident in the street. Oh I don't know God. what that was about. Good grief, man. That guy was going fast. <laughs> Good thing our kids aren't out there riding their bikes. Sorry. Our, throwing eggs at them. Our studio is in the front of our house and we can see the street. And someone just burned out the street and took off yeah, in a I'm small sorry. residential area. It just kind of freaked me out a little bit. But anyway, um, I think your closest relationships, does it hurt to communicate what you're going through? No, not necessarily. No, it hurt. You can just tell them I'm going through a lot of stuff right now. If I don't seem like myself, it's nothing against you. I just, I'm just going through this and the right people in your life are going to understand that. And they're going to leave you space. Maybe every so often they'll check up on you, but they're not going to press. These are the greatest people I had in these times. Mm-hmm. And they were there for me. They weren't, they weren't there to like, keep tabs or constantly check up or are you done with this or where do we stand? I got rid of that. Yeah. That stuff. I don't, I still to this day don't really deal with those people anymore, right. but right. now it's the people that were on board with the changes. Those are on board with my life and I'm okay with having them in and including them what I'm going through. But I didn't like talking about a lot of it. No, I didn't. I just didn't mm-hmm. like talking about a lot of this stuff. Like even my closest friends in the world, like I just, I went through a period of time where we didn't talk for a Many years, like maybe exchange a text message on birthdays or something like that. Yeah, but people, but understand. those people, those people get it. Yeah, and they are totally cool with it, and they kind of watch from afar, and they're proud of me, and they love me, and I love them, and those are the people you want to keep around. There exactly. are other number of these people who are going to feel like you're a traitor. You've changed. You're not ride or die. You're not loyal, man. F you. I don't care. I, I don't care. Right. This is what I had to do. Exactly. I did what I had to do. Yep. And I'm not apologizing for it. Yeah, I feel the same way. So as in a, I was in reading about this episode, I was just, you know, I'm all about the, I always like to read about the, the psychological, psychological standpoint, yeah. the <laughs> perspectives that kind of play into this. Uh huh. And so cocoon phase is kind of a generic term, but as it turns out, it is reflected in not only neuroscience, but it's also reflected in a lot of psychological theories that many people are very familiar with. Okay. So from the neuroscience standpoint, let me over this through my notes hang on a second okay so i learned something today about the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis so (laughs) the hpa (laughs) axis so chronic stress and trauma often experienced by spouses of addicts or abusive partners can dysregulate the hpa axis the cocoon phase allows for the down regulation of this stress response system and aids in recovery There's also the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex balance. We've talked about the amygdala. This is the part of the brain that is responsible for fear and emotional responses. Yeah. Think about how out of whack this gets when living in an addicted relationship. Way out of whack, right? And the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your brain that's involved in your rational thinking and decision making, the cocoon phase can help restore this balance, reduces your hypervigilance, always wondering what's going to happen next, and it improves your cognitive function as well. And so dopamine, serotonin levels, as well as um, cortisol levels start to regulate during this phase. Yes. And it is it is scientifically beneficial. Yes. So there's some behind that. But also psychologically, we talk about some of these frameworks of thought and 
frameworks of change. Um, Eric Erickson's stages of psychosocial development. So Eric Erickson, he had these eight stages of development and each of them were characterized by central conflict that has to be resolved in order for us to progress. And he kind of goes through them in different phases of our lives. Okay. Um, there's not really necessarily a one that fits what an addicted spouse is going through or what the spouse of an addict or alcoholic is going through. Mm -hmm. But there is this idea that through each of these, you go through this period of transformation and change, which is essentially the cocoon phase. Um, Carl Jung's uh, individuation process, we talked about that. We talked about that in previous episodes. Um, as we become uh, more aware of ourselves and we integrate different parts of our personality into our life, it aligns very much with the cocoon phase. Um, James Marsh's identity status theory, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We've all, I think we've talked about the pyramid on here, haven't we? About the hierarchy of needs? I think so. Yes, 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 um, yes. In today's day and age, many of us are at the top of the pyramid. Yeah. Luckily, if we're in a, living in a you know first world country and our basic needs are met, then we're very much here. But CBT backs this up. Uh, Post-traumatic growth theory backs this up. Mindfulness and acceptance-based theories back this up. The narrative theory backs this up. There's a ton of work out there, if you're more interested in learning about this, that backs this up. Yeah. And if you just look at your life as a whole, you've to where you are today, you have gone through several cocoon phases. Mm -hmm. We're just here to say is that this one is necessary in order to get to the other side, and you shouldn't feel sorry for it. You yeah. don't need to apologize for it. And in fact, it should be an exciting thing. Yes. It, it be might be one thing. of the most difficult phases that you've feel like you're going through but it's going to be the most important one in your life every time we've ever come out of one of these things you come out so much better things yeah. look a lot different things look different but things, things will be different so much better but it's not a bad different it's a good different for you and and your family like your children if you have children yeah it's a big deal it is it is and so as you're going through this we just wanted to say hey we see you we hear you and it's okay and in fact you're in the right place embrace and it you're around the right people oh something that is important to, to mention here as you isolate from maybe people that you're more familiar with it is important to be part of a community that are of others that are kind of going through a healing journey as, journey as well and there's no place better than that than the tufo community yes it's incredibly beneficial place but to sometimes know that it's okay to back out of that you too. don't have to comment and I just want people to know that there are others going through it and it's yes. okay. You aren't the only one in the wild that's going through this. And it's it's helpful at times to know and just validating to know that you're not the only one that feels crazy right now. Right. You're not the only one that's going through these massive changes. So I think that the reason it's most difficult for a lot of us to feel this process is that we might look at it as a negative thing. But if you switch your mindset to look at it as a positive thing and embrace it and realize that it's necessary, I think you'll get through it easier. Yeah. Yeah, man, the toxic positivity culture can talk you out of this. Um, like I was doing to you, like keep pushing through, just, you know, grind, hustle, show up every day, boss babe, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and that worked for me later on after the cocoon phase. Like when I had to push it, step it up a little bit more, like when it came to physical and things like that, yeah. Yeah, it, but it, there's a time and place for that because you know we've talked about like Goggins and 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 things. There's a time there's, and a place. There's for a that. time and place, but when you're in the cocoon phase, mm -mm, mm -mm, it's okay. It's okay. You are doing the hard stuff because you're working towards something within the cocoon phase, and it's okay to rest and it's okay to give yourself a break and and not go hard at everything all the time. So real quick, we discussed some of the things that were helpful for you, and like one of those is therapy, mm -hmm. and I, I don't think that. Sh it, can't speak for the benefits of it enough to have a good therapist on your side as you're going through this. Mm -hmm. We can serve as a guide for some interesting ideas and some thought provoking conversations and whatnot, but professional help goes a long way to getting you to where you want to be ultimately. Yeah. Um, and people have asked us like, where do I find a good therapist? What if I, if you're in the state of Texas, check out the Taylor counseling group. Um, if you are outside of the state, psychologytoday.com has got this really cool part on their website. If you click on their menu, it says find a therapist mm -hmm. and you can search by discipline, like what they, what they really focus on, what their specialties are, if they accept insurance or not, part of the country. How are you yawning? It's still daylight outside. I don't know. And I had an extra cup of coffee this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> but anyway, it's a, it's a great place to find, um, you know, an, yet another incredibly valuable resource as you're going through this cocoon phase. Yeah, for it's, sure. It's a lot. It's a lot. You know, you're going to be going in this cocoon for quite a while. Um, how long, no one exactly knows, but stay engaged, keep listening, keep reading, keep growing, 
And I promise you'll get to the other side. Yeah, and the part in our course about self how, uh, self-care is a lot about how I went through the cocoon phase and like how I did things to get through there. Yeah, so hey, we're glad you're in it and we can't wait to see you come out of it. Yep. And stick with us and you will. I can assure you that. For sure. All right, that's all we got. Till next time, I'm Matt. I'm Paige. And we'll see you. Bye.